the most common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is not coronary artery disease, it's alcohol. But when we talk about ischemic cardiomyopathy, which leads to dilated cardiomyopathy, the most common cause is coronary artery disease. Anytime you have dilated cardiomyopathy, you're going to have heart failure signs. This means that your legs will be swollen, you'll have fatigue and chest pain, shortness of breath, yeah. venous blood flow will be pulsatile. The left ventricle is going to have a more round shape. You're going to have this eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy where the walls are less than 0.6 centimeters or 6 millimeters. You might be expected to know what a dilated cardiomyopathy looks like on strain. The strain pattern for non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy will kind of show this equally reduced strain globally all throughout the left ventricle. If you pay attention to the numbers, all of the numbers should be all kind of equally reduced, meaning that the numbers here listed won't be that far apart from each other. As far as the colors are concerned, you're going to see a lot more pink all throughout with a little bit of blue and a little bit of red. Not all non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy strains look the same. You're definitely going to want to look for a lot of pink with some blue and lighter red. Now when you're comparing non-ischemic to ischemic cardiomyopathy, the strain pattern is going to look like this. You're going to see a lot more lighter and darker blue in the posterior basal and mid inferior lateral regions, as well as the basal and mid inferior regions, and finally the basal inferior septal regions, because these are the most common areas that are affected in ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. You can see here in the parasternal long axis view that the basal and mid inferior lateral or posterior wall is affected as well as in this two chamber, the basal and mid inferior wall. In this apical four chamber view, you can see that the basal inferior septal wall is affected. And then finally, the basal anterior septal wall. These are the most common areas that are affected with ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, which completely correlates with the strain. And this is what it would kind of resemble. Any number that's less than negative 17 on strain is abnormal. The treatment is going to be more so devices and medicine. It's so different than a patient with, you know, an acute myocardial infarction because at least you're going to have preserved thickening in other areas. This is the area that's out, but at least they have these walls. Here are some images of dilated cardiomyopathy. You can clearly see the left ventricle is dilated. It's got more of a round shape. Mitral valve is tethered, definitely right here. This is what an impella looks like. An impella buys some time until they can get the patient stable. The EF is so low that they need to put this device in the patient in the left ventricle. What this does is suck blood out of the left ventricle and into the aorta and out to the body because the left ventricle is at the time unable to meet the body's needs or metabolic demands. This is essentially like a balloon pump. This is a classic example of dilated cardiomyopathy. Here we have the cursor going through the mitral valve and we're looking at the inflow. We have the mitral valve E and A and then we have this little waveform right there. This is called a B bump. So a B bump is indicative of an elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure. You're gonna have all this pressure exhibited up against the mitral valve right at this timing, and it's gonna cause that little bump. Here's another M mode that suggests dilated cardiomyopathy, as well as a decreased stroke volume. How do I know that? In a normal uh, end mode of the aorta valve, it should kind of look like that. Right here is when the aorta valve is opened, and then it closes here and here, right? But look at this one. Look how, so it opens here, and then it just gradually decreases, and then closes. So that suggests that the stroke volume has decreased. Then we can measure what's called the 
E point to septal separation or the EPSS. I want you to write down echo signs of dilated cardiomyopathy. First one was B bump, followed by decreased stroke volume, which would be kind of like a gradual closure of the aortic valve. Then you're going to have an EPSS that will measure greater than 7 millimeters or 0.7 centimeters. A normal EPSS is less than 0.7 centimeters or 7 millimeters. And essentially what you'll do is just measure from your E wave to your anterior septum. If you measure this, EPSS, this says 3, what could you tell me about what's going on with just this image here? If you saw this alone, you know that the function is probably reduced. Their stroke volume will also be decreased. Look how close the E wave is to the anterior septum. Not much of a space, right? That's pretty normal. This is a normal M mode. Myocarditis. What do you know about myocarditis? It's an inflammation of the myocardium. With myocarditis, this is kind of a weird one. You're going to have wall motion abnormalities in weird areas of the myocardium. It's pretty easy to know which walls are affected, you know, when a patient has a right coronary myocardial infarction. It's going to be areas like the posterior wall, the bottom of the heart or behind the heart, and it'll be basal or mid infraroceptum. So in an apical four chamber view, if someone had a right coronary ischemic reaction or ischemia in, in RCA, you're going to know that the basal and maybe the mid infraroceptum will be affected. In the peristernal long axis, it'll be mostly the posterior wall or parts of the inferior lateral wall. In the apical two-chamber view, it's, if it's the RCA only, then it'll be the inferior wall that's affected. But with myocarditis, it's going to be random areas. It can be any wall affected. And the reason why I say that is because when you're scanning someone and you're getting all these different random areas that are hypokinetic that aren't leading to a specific coronary, that will tell you that there's possibly some sort of uh, inflammation going on. And the problems, the etiology of myocarditis stem from viral or bacteria. Patients who are addicted to drugs, specifically cocaine and other stimulants, can have this type of problem. With myocarditis, you can have either dilated or hypertrophic ventricles. The physical sign that sets this apart from ischemic or an acute myocardial infarction is that the patient could have a fever along with hypotension, but they'll have the same pathological EKG findings like the T wave inversion as well as uh, ST elevation or depression. And uh, QT prolongation, digoxin overdose or whatever, too much digoxin, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that can cause that. Are you going to put a stent in this patient or do a bypass? No. No, no, of course not. You're going to treat the problem, which is either bacteria or viral. If it's bacteria, you're going to use antibiotics. And if it's viral, you're going to use corticosteroids. Oh, here's a good EKG of myocarditis. You'll have T wave inversions. And then here is an image of myocarditis. And in this one, it's more so dilated. And keep in mind, with myocarditis, you can have either a dilated left ventricle or a hypertrophic left ventricle. And this image here resembles hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is more thickened myocarditis, and this one is more dilated.